Welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment clinic in Seattle, Washington. On this podcast, we talk about all things food, body, movement, and mental health. I'm Dr. Lexi Giblin, your host for today, and I'm here with Kara Bazzi, Opal Clinical Director and Co-Founder. Hi, everybody. Happy to have you with me. Thank you. Yes. Today is an exciting day because we are launching our self-inquiry series. And I'm finding myself more nervous today for this recording because I think I care so much about self-inquiry. And I have been wanting to sort of open the um, group room door and let others into what we're up to in self-inquiry group at Opal because it is so powerful. It is just my favorite group at Opal. And it is just powerful to see how people are changed by the self-inquiry process and hear the questions that are asked. It is just amazing. So I am thrilled today to uh, take you into that experience of self-inquiry. Um, so in this series, we we will conduct an Opal self-inquiry group on the podcast live. And listeners will learn the self-inquiry process and potentially find resonance and inspiration in the difficult questions posed to take to their own self-inquiry work. And today we have two people who will join us in the studio to do self-inquiry. Before we hear from them, though, let's talk, let's talk about what self-inquiry is all about. So self-inquiry is a core mindfulness skill in radically open dialectical behavioral therapy, also known as RODBT, which was founded by Dr. Tom Lynch. And in the self-inquiry process, we are choosing to go towards unwanted emotions or distress for a very specific reason. And you want a good reason to choose to go towards unwanted emotion, right? And, and there's a really good reason here, and that is for learning and growth. So a basic assumption that we're making in self-inquiry is that the emotional difficulty is a great teacher and one of our greatest teachers. So moving away from emotional difficulty or dysregulation, as we call it in RODBT, can block potential growth. And one of the things I say to our PHP clients is that they, while they're in higher level of care with us, they are in this moment of crisis in their lives. And with that crisis comes a great deal of opportunity for learning. So the worse the adver adversity, the greater the opportunity for learning. And in other words, good therapy hurts. Right? So we, this process is, is, it is intentionally painful, right? Because that is where the learning is. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, Lexi, I know when something really hurts, it's hard to want to do it. So I'm curious, how long does someone do a practice like this? Yes. In traditional RODBT, the self-inquiry process is um, intentionally short at about three to five minutes. And as Dr. Lynch says, you want to visit the cemetery. You don't want to build your home in the cemetery. So self-inquiry serves as is really more of a touch point for feeling hurt, not an invitation to choose to swim in pain all of the time. And we really want it to be a place that you would want to return. So it's intentionally short for that reason as well. And then is it something you do on your own or is it a group practice all the time like we're going to be doing today? Yeah. So you can do self-inquiry in all sorts of ways. I often say that there is a self-inquiry lifestyle that you can live <laughs> where you're just when, when you experience difficult emotion, you get curious about it as you go through your day. So it just sort of is part of your, your way of being. But the formal process um, can be in a journal or verbally with someone else. And to say a little bit more about self-inquiry, what you're trying to do is find your edge or the place where the known meets the unknown. And you're assuming that 
you have blind spots or that we all have blind spots and you're getting curious about what you do not yet understand about yourself, the world, people, experiences, and you, you understand in self-inquiry that we can't see what we can't see. And the, the work of self-inquiry is to try to see what you haven't been able to see yet. So in self-inquiry, you're feeling emotion. You're feeling along with curiosity. So it's experiential in that your emotion is leading the way, the way while you're layering on questioning and curiosity. So it's not just a cognitive process. It's an emotional process. And you're seeking your shadow self or the part of you that you would rather not see. And you're intentionally disturbing the peace and looking for dis dysregulation. So it's a place where ambiguity, complexity, and messiness reign supreme. As I always say, if it's complex, let it be complex. If it's ambiguous, let it be ambiguous. Self-inquiry really is the antithesis to tying things up in a neat bow. You're really letting it be whatever it is. You're not trying to make it into something it's not. So we're searching for unexpected ways of thinking, unexpected understandings, and we're looking out for old stories or sort of these patterned routine ways we have of making sense of our experiences. And importantly, we are working to find good questions, not answers. So in self-inquiry, we are suspicious of quick answers because quick answers can often serve to regulate our emotion and move us away from dysregulation where the learning is. So in RODBT, good questions are questions that cause dysregulation or elicit discomfort, resistance sometimes, confusion other times, strong emotion, or sometimes just a physical tension. And those questions that elicit those difficult emotions, those are the keepers okay. and the ones that you might want to take to your self-inquiry practice moving forward. So that gives us all like a really good context for the self-inquiry process, but I'm curious if you can give us more specifics of what this actually, what this process actually looks like. Yes. Yeah, so there, I would break down the self-inquiry process into three main steps. So within this three to five minutes, you are first identifying a specific time when you experienced an unwanted emotion so this is the, the step where you're feeling. So you're, you're moving, you're bringing up in your mind's eye the experience, the specific time when you experience the unwanted emotion and with bringing up all that was happening for you then in the here and now. So you take yourself back into what it felt like. Uh, so what sounds, sights, smells, sensations in your body do you notice? And I like to, when I do self-inquiry, I like to hone in on the, the moment when I felt the most intensity in the specific memory. So when did I notice tears come to my eyes immediately? When did I notice my, my heart begin to beat rapidly? What happened just before? So take yourself back in. That's the first step is the feeling part. Take yourself back into the specific time. And then while feeling... Um, the second step, so you've got the emotion there, you're trying to hold it there, and the second step is to get curious and ask the question, what is the learning here? And here you're not wanting to come with your patterned old ways of thinking about the learning. So it's sort of this question of what is the learning here or what do I not yet understand? is another way of asking that question. What am I missing? And then the third and final step is to find a reminder. So find a good question that would get you back to this learning in the future. And this question is often one that you do not want to ask. 
and it should prompt you to feel the dysregulation you associated with the learning um, that you did and the self-inquiry. So you're trying to provoke, can be provocative with yourself in this process and ask the difficult questions, the ones that you would rather not ever hear in your whole life. <laughs> okay. So now we'd like to introduce you to Andrea and Sally, who have agreed to join Kara and I in the studio today to practice self-inquiry. Any identifying information has been removed from this recording. Hi, Andrea. Hello. And Sally, hi. Thank you for being here. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Well, we'd like to in invite you to do a five-minute journal self-inquiry process. And in this process, you'll be doing three steps. You'll be going through three steps. So you'll first identify a time when you experienced an unwanted emotion or unwanted sensation or energy of some sort. And you'll try to take yourself back into it emotionally. And then once you're there, ask that second, do the second step, which is to get curious about what the learning is. What is the learning here? What do I not yet understand? And then finally, third, what's a good question to get me back to this learning Okay, so we'll give you five minutes and be back. Okay, so Sally and Andrea have just done five minutes of journal self-inquiry work. And now we will add to this work by entering a group process. And I want to say a few words about the power of the group process of self-inquiry. Um, and we'll be doing this in this series where we, where we double down on the power of independent self-inquiry by positioning the work in a group context such as this, where multiple viewpoints can come to play in the process. The different perceptual biases that we all bring into this room will create a particularly fertile ground for helping you see the parts of yourselves that you cannot see. Self-inquiry on your own is tough when you when you're searching for what you can't see you, and it's hard to see what you can't see so this space offers you uh, other viewpoints of on your work and maybe can jog some learning that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access so this is extra heat on they've just done five minutes of uh, self-inquiry work in their journal. And now they're going to be going to, sh they're going to share their self-inquiry work with us and then um, uh, allow us to ask questions of, of their self-inquiry work. And so it's important that Andrea and Sally, you, you know that you can end this self-inquiry process at any time if it feels like it's no longer helpful. So we will write down the questions you're receiving so that you can have them for later and focus on how it feels to consider the questions that are being posed of you. Remember, we're looking for good questions, not answers. And we're looking for good questions, in other words, zingers, or the ones that are difficult or confusing to hear. For those of us not doing self-inquiry, our job is to serve as provocateurs and ask asshole questions. And we're doing this with utmost kindness. Um, we will work to not validate or soothe or ask questions that will regulate you in your work. And we do this uh, with, with kindness, as I said because our kindness, our questions are coming from a place of interest in your growth and learning. So our, our work to sort of sit on our hands and not validate and soothe and ask questions that would regulate uh, is, is our way of showing care for your interest in learning. So Sally, would you start by sharing, taking us into the journal work that you just did. Yes. Um, 
The journal work I did was around an incident that happened recently with one of my kids. And um, it was a, it was an incident where I felt overwhelmed. I felt um, a little lost, like different directions to go, wasn't sure which direction to go. And I, I also was, I think, battle, well, I think I was battling some guilt. Um, yeah. Okay. So guilt was the primary emotion? <laughs> that was the emotion being repressed primarily. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, um, yeah, there's a narrative in the family around moments like this. And this particular kid hasn't felt, has been able to tell me they haven't felt the best care in the, these kinds of moments. And so I was like, how do I do this better? But we're in a different chapter and kind of got flooded with, with all of that. Okay. And what, when you asked the question, what is the learning here? What did you mm. come up with? Um, what I came up with you know, in the I'll own right now, like there's a part of me that wants to do this right. Um, so I'm like, oh, does my answer, did I give the right answer to this question? So I'm just going to own that. Mm -hmm. um, which is weird because that brings up a little emotion, um, which is the theme, right? I want to do it right. I want to do it right to my kid. I want to do it right in this moment. Um, so... I guess maybe the learning is what is driving me to want to have to do this, do everything right. What's the fear behind not doing it right? Is, is that answer the question mm -hmm. you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you ask yourself that question, do you, what do you, what is that dysregulating to consider? I think it feels, um, just horrible to think that I would not do something right by another person. Like, I don't mind failing a test, but when it comes to, like, people in my life, that feels like, like the failure I do not want is to have done something wrong relationally. Yet, I know I, I mean, I have a million times, but, um, and then especially kind of depending on, like, the circle of intimacy that I'm in with those people. So my kiddos being, you know, the top and not wanting to do it wrong again, you know. Um. Okay. okay. And are you open to questions from us? I am. Okay. The first question <clears throat> that comes to my mind is what if you don't ever know if you're going to do it right? Like, I'll never know? Mm-hmm. Well, that's terrifying. Is that like, my whole body is, like, tingling mm -hmm. when you ask, when you make that statement. Mm hmm mm hmm What if you never know if you did it right? That was the question? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can feel a strong resistant to that. It's kind of like that's not an acceptable option. I can think of a question. Um, you mentioned this being like a narrative in the family um, and that your kid expressing to you that they felt a lack of care in that moment. And... I think I'm hearing you also want to be caretaken in that. And so my question is, why is there a need for you to feel, for you to um, receive care in that, in that situation as well? It, like that seems maybe what's coming to the forefront. And why, why do you feel the need to be caretaken? Mm -hmm. 
in my head goes to like analytical answers, but mm-hmm. trying to stay with just, oh, wow, that makes me teary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just letting it, letting it sit and letting it be there rather than moving to answers is really a key part of this work. My question is, or one of my questions is, what is on the line? Mm. Like, sort of like, why does this, why does doing it right matter so much? Mm. What's on the line? Yeah, I think I've asked that question so many, well, not in that way, but I, I like have a very quick answer. I notice I have a very quick answer to that. So that feels like it more regulates me. Mm-hmm. Interesting enough. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I actually, now that I own that, I'm wondering if I let that typical answer go and stay with the unknown, like maybe there's another answer, Mm. then that again feels kind of scary. Mm. Going back to the what if you never know, you did it right. Right. And you don't have an answer. What happens when you don't have an answer? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yeah. that feels like the cutting edge. The Kara's question feels like the one that's really hitting on an edge. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, that sounds like a a good question for you to work with in your in your practice. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Really appreciate you sharing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now let's turn to Andrea. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think I'll start with. Um, naming the emotion that came up for me, which I thought I I came into this thinking I had an emotion. And then as I journaled, it actually um, transformed into something else. So I'm going to say the emotion that came up for me was dread. And um, so this comes up around my relationship with my mom. And it's so interesting since, you know, Sally just spoke of an experience being on the the parental side. Um, but, and I experienced this very recently, yesterday, um, getting phone calls from my mom um, fills me with some dread because of how some of those conversations have gone in the past. And um, that... I don't always, I would say in the last couple of years, I dread phone calls with my mom because I don't know how they're going to go. My mom's emotions are hard for me, and a lot of the times I feel uh, like I just don't know what I'm getting into. I don't want to pick up the phone. I don't know if she's going to be in a good mood or a bad mood, and how's that going to land for me? Um, yeah, so I think dread is the really unwanted emotion because I, then I feel shame around being a bad daughter. Okay. And when you asked the question, what's the learning here? Did you come with any thoughts on that? Uh, I feel like... That kind of came easy, but then I was second guessing why, like the answer or the what am I missing? I feel like what I'm missing is my mom's experience. Um, And I think that's the big unknown, like why there's something going on for my mom in our conversations. I think that I feel like I'm not getting what I need from her. And I think, why, why, why can't she give me what I need? And then what is it that she, what is it that she needs that I feel like I don't know? 
Okay, and are you open to questions from us? Okay. Yes. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's typical for there to be a lot of space between the questions because we're all just taking in um, what you just shared, the power of what you just shared and kind of seeing where our minds go about where, where to take things. So I always appreciate the, the spacing between questions so that we can process and then also you can process what you hear. So. The first question that comes to my mind is, can you be a good daughter and still be disappointed with your mom? Yeah, that. I, I want to really push back on that. Like, I want to, yeah. That lands. <laughs> So maybe in a similar vein, what makes you think that a good daughter means that you would always be feel positive towards your mom? I find like I want to answer that. Like I feel <laughs> like I know where, where that idea comes from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a good question. What if you knew your mom's experience and it still didn't make sense? Yeah, I think that one makes me feel sad. What would it be like to accept your mom can't meet your needs? That one feels a little less dysregulating. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, my, um, this is Sally, and I'm wondering if, um, if there's any part of you that might be scared or resistant from actually knowing your mother's reasons. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a hard question. That one hits you. Yeah, I think that one makes me want to cry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it sounds like we hit on a few different good questions that could lead to some learning for you. So we'll close there. And I just want to express my gratitude for your bravery and sharing these most um, important like, parts of your experience in life with us and with um, our listeners. And I hope that this process can bring you, um, our listeners, a, a sense of what self-inquiry can look like and a sense of the power of the learning that can come from self-inquiry. So thank you to Andrea and Sally for taking us into your brave, difficult self-inquiry work. And thank you to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering. Thanks to Aaron Davidson for the Appetite's original music and to David Bozzi for editing. If you want to learn more about Opal's programming, go to opalfoodandbody.com. Until next time. <laughs>